guns. But there was no real charge for guns when I was a kid. So people carried guns free. It's a to totally different world. It, it completely. I mean, crack re really sort of revolutionized everything. Like the proliferation of large caliber weapons started to happen during the crack era. You know, like when I was in junior high school, like guys had 22s and 25s and little guns. And by the time, you know, maybe 10 years later, like dudes are carrying machine guns and, you know, have access to rocket launchers and all sorts of scary shit. Yeah, like they, they talk about how... Um how every few years, every cell in your body is replaced. So in a few years, you're literally no longer the same person. And think about that in terms of New York City. It's like every few years or a, a big portion of the people, the infrastructure, and the laws change to the point where the, the Brooklyn, the New York City that you grew up in, that you saw graffiti and that you uh, saw these stick-up kids, a lot of that, for a major part, is, is no longer existing. And I think about that time era as a time where... Um, Granted, I didn't take part in it, but it's like nothing is really 100% good or 100% bad. And that era, from what I see, it spawned so much uh, art and culture. It spawned uh, the, the particularly like the graffiti writers that legitimately started a movement around the entire planet. And that's uh, and part of me is like you, you talk about opportunism and uh, that kind of stems from some sort of need and uh, like the graffiti writers at that point, like they brought so much flavor, they bought, they invented their own culture with their own rules and their own, their own uh, tactics, their own uh, traditions, things like things like racking, th things like uh, the fact that you have to do this many on this train lines inside and out, and all all that stuff. It's like pretty pretty much like it was a it was a world of uh, you know violence and stuff, also a world of a lot of uh, art and culture from not just graffiti but also from music to just general art and. And, and all that stuff. Uh, how do you think that that time period and, and the violence and the, and the laws and the criminalities that were happening influenced your mind? Because it was essentially during a period of your life where it's like the foundational period of your life, which is so sure. important to framing <clears throat> everything else. You know what I mean? No, the formative years were crazy. And, and it was, you know, not by the choice, but sort of, you know, it was the world I lived in and not by design, but it was the world I lived in. And dysfunction was rampant. At times it was celebrated, and it was just everywhere. And, you know, it's really easy to normalize dysfunction. Like, if, you, if that's the world you know, you don't have anything else to compare what your daily, day-to-day -day experiences yeah. are. Like, there's nothing that I could have looked at when I was, you know, 18. It took me to be in my 20s until I moved out. But I think that, you know, similarly, jazz and, you know, blues and all of these things are birthed from, like, hardship and hard times. Mm. And... And there's something, you know, real about that. Um, hard times birthing, something that's like as beautiful as art and graffiti or hip hop or whatever that might be. And for so many of us, like it's a crowded city, it's easy to fall through the cracks here. And graffiti kind of, you know, um, gave you an opportunity to stand out. Like, you know, graffiti writers are super possessive. Like this is my line, this is my wall, this is my train, this is my yard. And that's coming from a community of people that didn't have very much. So what you have, it's almost like prison in a weird way, right? Like in jail, like if everyone's wearing slippers and you've got a pair of Jordans on, you're the man. And, you know, but having something when no one else has something is just enormously important. This weird little metric of like, I got a ring on or a watch on. Like you don't need a watch in prison, but I guess it makes you look cooler amongst mm. other people if you can hold that down or you've got something flashy. But we were a community of people that just didn't have much. In the dysfunction, I mean, I grew up in projects, and there was no clear distinction. Like, the building I grew up in looked like, the hallways looked like jail. Like, the, the yard that we hung out in kind of looked like a courtyard in prison, and all of the coolest dudes on my block were dudes that just came home with an extra 25 pounds of prison swole and muscle. And, you know, that's a lot of, there are a lot of layers there to unpeel as an adult. and You know, it took me moving outside of New York to realize just how... Um, fucked up it was the way I grew up mm. and then meeting people I dated someone that wasn't from New York and when I saw the school she went to and I was like Jesus this is like a college campus your elementary school your junior high school your high school and your colleges all look like this and you know my school's allocated to this one little block it's all concrete there are no trees or anything so it was a drastically different experience but it wasn't until I moved outside of New York where I started to like talk to people that weren't a part of this criminal element or weren't shady, like I could leave my door unlocked, although I never did. 
um, chances are if someone was running up behind me, they were jogging. And it really, <laughs> like, it, I had nothing to compare life to other than what I knew from New York. So it's very easy to normalize. You know, there are people that grew up whose parents were like pimps, right? And that's just normal in their household, that his mom was a hooker, his dad was a pimp, and that he had a stable of women. Like, I, I don't know if I can point to anything that's as dysfunctional or disturbing in my head, right? But for folks that grew up that way, that's just normal. And there was really nothing that told me what we were doing wasn't normal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and sadly, I mean, I think most of the guys I looked up to until a certain point in my life were super dysfunctional. And the craziest dude on the block was a dude that, you know, you wanted to be friends with. And I can tell you as an adult, man, that crazy dude is the last dude you want in your home in 2021. Yeah. You know what I mean? And But as a kid, I didn't really have anything I could point to that told me that this wasn't healthy. And, and there's there's no there's no Instagram, there's no YouTube, there's no, like, you can't just see the life of people from all over the world in a split second. So it's not easy to compare. You just see your homie next door and uh, the people at your school, and this is just the world, the entire world, maybe, to you. But what I can say is the beauty of graffiti is that it got me off my block. Mm. And, you know, I could still visit my mom. She still lives in the same neighborhood, and I could see a lot of the dudes I grew up with still on the block. And there's dudes on my block that are still hustling. 99%, maybe 90% of the dudes that I hung out with growing up all sold crack once that became a thing. And thankfully I had graffiti and it got me off the block. And because I wanted to paint trains in the story, I had to ride the R train, or which was a double R, to the last stop at Ditmars to go paint trains in Astoria. Um, I had boys uptown, so we'd go to paint trains at 155th Street Layup beneath the polo ground. So I'm in Harlem. I'm in Washington Heights painting at 175th Street Layup. I'm in East New York. I'm in Sunset Park. I'm in Lower Manhattan and Midtown riding on trains. So my graffiti experience got me off the block. I met people from all different cultures and races and religion and ethnicities. And it really did give me a better rounded New York experience. You know, um, I was coming out of a party one day and I saw these dudes from my block and they saw us on the West Side Highway and they were honking the horn. And for the next five years, all they talked about was, yo, remember that time we saw you in Manhattan? Like as if I bumped into them in Cairo or we were like on the French Riviera or something like mm. that. And it was, it was a huge <laughs> yeah, yeah. deal yeah. because they don't leave the block. And they would ask me all the time, shit, like, yo, wait, when you leave the block, where do you go? There are still people all over the place in New York that are like that. I, I get it. I read a story once where this dude had never left his Bushwick neighborhood. He was a grown man. His entire world revolved around living in Bushwick. He had never been on a train into Manhattan or Queens. And I could kind of see that happen. So I'm, I'm absolutely grateful. Graffiti got me off the block. I mm -hmm. think I was literally like a hair away from potentially being that dude that was still on the block somehow. You, but, when you were younger, did you ever feel like, yo, I want to be a part? Like you say, the cool dudes in your neighborhood was the, were the dudes who come in, you know, 20, 25 pounds of swole from prison. You never wanted to join, like, uh, FMD, Crazy Bishops, any of those gangs? Oh, yeah. I, you I, admired I, them? or Seventh, eighth grade, we were trying to dress like them. And, you know, the truth is that I'm fortunate that in spite of my mom being overwhelmed, being a single mom and holding down an enormous Latino family and taking care of me and my two brothers – that there was a lot of love in the house and that we did have guidance. The bad decisions I decided to make outside of the house were solely on me, mm. right? But I was fortunate that I had a base at home and a lot of these folks didn't. And that's what kind of made my experience a little bit different from theirs. We yeah. were all poor, but some of these dudes I know went home and there was no one in the house when they got there. They were fending for themselves. They had to steal food to feed themselves and, you know. And it's all of these crazy things where by today's standards, like, you know, um, some sort of state agency, there'd be some sort of intervention, hopefully, in 2021 if there was a kid at home without a parent that wasn't eating. Mm -hmm. But this was sort of normal. Like, I went to school with kids that were physically abused with, like, welts on them from extension cords, and they weren't showering, and they smelled bad. And I don't think that these types of things can slip through the cracks today. Whether or not they're effective at addressing these problems in 2021, I think at very least their agencies and their systems and like, you know, I think your teacher will probably make the assessment like this kid looks bad and they'll have a conversation with the guidance counselor and maybe call in a parent and see if they can help somehow. But there was no intervention, like just things were super dysfunctional. But yeah, I wanted to be like gang, uh, the gang dudes on my block that were a little bit older than me 
kind of hung out. One day I was on route to school, and these dudes were just posted up in the subway with bandanas on. And as I turned the corner, they were just like ready to. And it's two dudes I grew up with. They were my friend's older brothers. And they were like, I was like, what are you guys doing? They're like, yeah, we're out here for Vicks. And they were trying to rob people. And foolishly, I just kind of hung out with them for a little while, shooting the shit. I didn't think that whatever they might have done could have landed me in prison. And then the truth is that they were at my local train station. They could have stuck up my mom. Mm. And then the longer I got to know them, they robbed people in the building that they grew up with. And they did all sorts of crazy shit. And graffiti is the kind of thing that once, you know, um, once that spark was lit, it just really, you know, I've said this before, but when you discover that thing in life that you're passionate about, it sort of just changes the trajectory of your life, right? Like it dictates who you decide to spend your time with and what you spend your free time doing and everything starts to change. And once I found, you know, discovered graffiti, it, you know, it, it really sort of uh, got me off of that gang. But I did a lot of bad things, you know, in, in writing illegal graffiti and stealing spray paint. You make allowances for yourself, you know, like, you know, my ability to normalize going into a store and maybe stealing 50 cans of paint, right? Like, that's not okay. As an adult, I understand mm -hmm. that. I'm not gonna criticize anyone that still does it, but as at that stage in my life, you know, just like... It's literally, it's literally normalized. Like, Completely, I'm... Like, no one sees it as borderline not even a crime at that point. And, and I'm pissed off that we got caught stealing, or the guy looked at me funny on the way out. Yeah. He had every right to. I'm up to no good. Mm. But, you know... um. Yeah, stealing spray paint. And then, you know, um, quote from Star Wars, which I've cited on a bunch of times, is that graffiti is a vocation and its youthful traditions are handed down from one young generation to the next. 